Okay, so moving on to monitoring and, and why, why we're here today. Um, we're going to be having a look at, at monitoring. So what, what we want to do is, is collect a lot of information over a period of time to calculate a trend. You know, are, are we moving up, down, left, right? Um, are buildings moving in on themselves further away? Is, is, is land becoming eroded? That sort of thing. Um, so how do we trace this movement and how do we um, deliver this movement to, to our funds? Some of the challenges we face, you know, the, the top left little cartoon is showing a domino effect um, with, with the buildings that, that get put into place. Well, it quite often feels like that if you're in a city, if you know, the buildings are so close together, there's construction to our left, there's construction to our right, there's a building in the middle, you know, you, what we do on site does affect things and we need to prove that um, what we're doing is not affecting what, what is going on around us because if it is then we could be in a lot of trouble. Not just the construction sites, um, to infrastructure that's already in place, land um, or, or building um, for, for things like landslides, erosions, um, these things may not be a problem if we if we're aware of them and aware of when, when these might happen, but if we're not in control of the situation, then it could be obviously very disastrous. Um, looking at London and take London as, as a good, an example, it's you know, a very good example. It's a, a world city nowadays and it's ever changing. The buildings are getting higher and higher and higher and, and closer together as well. And it's not just what's going on. Um, overground, but also what's happening underground as well. You know, we're putting in lots of new tunnels at the moment, um, and, and the holes that we're digging in the ground will obviously impact on, on stuff around it. So we need to make sure that we keep a very close eye on, on the movements that we make on the site. Traditionally, uh, we've kept an eye on movements with various sensors. So there's various geotechnical sensors we can employ, tilt sensors, pressure size, etc., etc. There's, there's a massive array of, of this type of thing that we can we can get into a monitoring um, system. Um, we deal with more of the geodetic stuff, so the, the the sensors that will actually give you X, Y, Z um, positions um, and, and the various ways that, that we would do that, and um, that obviously the different sensors, different jobs require um, the different individual sensors that we would employ. So total stations for, as, it, you know, as we would say, high accuracy positions in over relatively short distances. So normally observing targets um, within a, a relatively close range. Uh, GPS would be for not, not quite as accurate as total stations, although they are getting more accurate all the time. But um, these are very useful for large monitoring uh, projects, um, and also to keep an eye on on reference objects. You know, if we've got um, prisms set a long way from um, from our control uh, from, our, from our instruments, then we can keep an eye on those reference objects via GPS, um, just just to give us more redundancy, really, more of an idea of that, that nothing is moving. And laser scanners at the bottom now are being used more and more in monitoring. Um, not necessarily as an automated sense, but would be manual monitoring. But to look at, at specialized areas, um, you know, massive, massive data acquisition, and we can look at these special areas in, in, very, in very close detail. And the fact that they're getting more affordable now, um, more and more people can consider laser scanners for monitoring. And it's just a quick look at the sensors. This, this is the Trimmel S8 total station. This is the our monitoring total station. Um, it's the same chassis as all of our robotic range, basically. So S3, S6, S8, um, exactly the same shape. The S8 is a more accurate version. So it comes complete with fine lock for an accuracy, a guaranteed accuracy of one millimeter. Um, objects within 300 meters, um, but it has an eventual range of two and a half kilometers. 
Um, and it's got you know a few other sensors in there, Trimble Vision, um, so it's got the calibrated metric imaging camera in there um, to use as well and make use of. So it's it's got a lot of stuff in there basically. A fine lock, um, now my apologies, there is a slight animation on this slide which probably won't come out terribly well uh, via the webinar. But manual aiming, if you imagine um, aiming onto a prism, um, depends on how much of a perfectionist you are, but you're going to be wandering around that prism a little bit. Uh, fine lock basically takes many, many aimings of that prism. Uh, over a, over a two-second period to guarantee that excellent accuracy, basically. Um, and it also has a very narrow field of view, so you can set prisms up very close together and still differentiate between them. Um, the SA also has MagDrive, as all of our S-series range do. Um, this is very useful for monitoring because what MagDrive is basically is, is is a system, a drive system that's based on, on magnets. So it's the same sort of technology as you'll see in a, a maglev train. So there's no metal-to-metal -metal contact, which means that it's, it's very long-lasting, very good for wear and tear if, if instruments are constantly rotating on a monitoring scheme. Uh, very good for energy efficiency. You know, if you have to power your instrument by, by a solar panel or something like that, and it's also, also pretty much totally silent. So if you are having to put an instrument close to a, a residence window or something like that, that it won't affect them during the night. So I'm going to keep them up. Uh, it's also got Trimble Vision uh, involved. So there's, there's cameras inside these total stations now which are metric calibrated images. So what we can start to do, if we've got coordinated stations and we take photos from those coordinated stations, um, let's take this uh, power line for, as an example. We can take an, uh, a photo from station one um, and in the software afterwards uh, we can say okay measure a point to, to the top of that. Then do exactly the same from station two and via basically stereo photogrammetry we can create a photo point. So without actually taking any measurements on site just using from the photography afterwards we can get extra points which is very useful if you need to. Um, touch on GPS for monitoring. Um, Trimble has a, has a large pedigree um, in, in GNSS and we've got various receivers and antennas for, for using GNSS for monitoring. So we would use um, uh, an R7 or a NetR9 on the right. And the NetR9 actually has the same chipsets as um, the, the R10 that you saw before. So it's receiving 440 different channels from various um, satellites and all, all the different signals and channels that they're using. And it's you know, fully capable of tracking the, the, the GPS GLONASS as well as uh, Baidu and Galileo when they become online. Uh, there's currently 16 Baidu um, satellites, the Chinese constellation in the air at the moment. And we're already tracking those. And then we've got various chokering antennas and geodetic antennas depending on the specification of the project. Uh, touch on laser scanning. It depends on, on what you want to do, um, but we've, you know, whether you need a, a very quick, small, portable um, laser scanner would, would be a Trimble TX5 on the left. Um, previously with a, a Faro Focus rebranded as a, a Trimble TX5. Um, on the right is the Trimble FX, which is which is used for very very accurate work, sort of sub millimeter, 0 0.4 millimeter scanner, um, and in the middle a Trimble VX, which will be our hybrid um, total station scanning solution. So, with all those sensors available, as well as all the geotechnical stuff, we can start to take a very um, flexible approach when looking at a project. So, really drill down what we want to get out of this monitoring scheme, um, what sensors we want to employ. So just a little think about planning the network. You know, are we going to set up inside the zone of influence, outside the zone of influence? 
where our reference objects are going to be, how many they're going to be, and, and, and whereabouts they are. Um, if they're inside the zone of influence, perhaps we'll pop some GPS on top of them just to keep an eye on, on the reference objects um, and take that into account when we when we both both when we plan the network and as the results come in and we can we can tweak the network if those reference objects move about. So let's take this bridge as an example. Bridge is a fairly good example for monitoring. They'll probably need monitoring at some stage during their life. So what we can do, um, Joe Gloves can come along day one, set up some prisms on his bridge and come along with his SA, set it up on a tripod if he wishes, but it would be better on, um, on a, a permanent monument like this and take a round of angles. Um, this would be done using our, our data loggers, Trimble Access. This would be a really a manual monitoring process though. So you could you could do this every day, every month, every year if you wanted to. Um, and then the software would, would always go back to those targets and, and, and uh, be able to interval those uh, around of angles every minute or every hour or whatever you want to do basically. And then afterwards when you finish, you can pump those results into the monitoring software that we would use uh, called Trimble 4D Control. If the scheme was of a, a larger nature or it was going to be going on for a long time and the client needed you to um, observe these observations you know, at specific times, maybe every hour or something along those lines, we could put some protection around the instrument to stop it from being stolen um, and observe 24 hours a day, seven days a week if we wanted to um, automatically. Um, and as long as we powered that instrument by a, by a cable or batteries or um, solar power if we needed to, um, and then we could get that, that data streaming into the software automatically, again, via various methods, via the internet or via radio link or a hard wire, depending on what would be um, sufficient to our project. Alternatively, we could employ GPS to monitor the same the same bridge and rely solely on that, or we could combine the systems together or further integrate them, as I, as I touched on before, with, with putting GPS over our reference prisms to give us extra redundancy, basically. Um, and of course, we can employ additional sensors as well, and we can bring in those geotechnical sensors into Trimble 4D control uh, again via various methods, um, generally via CSV file or something like that. Um, alternatively, if we were thinking outside a little bit, we could set up a scanner on our column, do a scan of the bridge, say, on day one of the, of the project, um, and then repeat that scan daily or weekly or monthly, however, however often we would like, and pump that into Trimble RealWork software to do uh, what's called a twin surface comparison, um, again, scan to scan, basically, to, to, to show the differences. Um, and that there is a project later on, which I'll, I'll talk about where, where that's being done. So the software itself and, and how we can bring that in, um, the top line there, post-processing of Trimble access data, that is your um, man going out, bringing, doing, doing the monitoring manually, the rest of it really can be all automated um, and brought into the software via various data streams and the software, once configured, will work all that sort of stuff out for you and take a lot of the hardship out of the, out of the equation. So the way it would work, we would set up a data collector in the software when we, when we configure it, basically tell the software to expect a, a Trimble S8. Um, and to send those raw observations in. We would then tell the software how to calculate that, um, so based upon those coordinates and those reference objects that we've got, um, what, what, to, what to bring out basically, so send out those machines and coordinates. The defamation monitor then would adjust the network for us and, and give us basically a usable result at the end. So to, to pop 
populate our graphs and our and our various different deliverables that the client will want. So this is the way the software sits together. Um, the T4D server in the middle there, that will be collecting data from optical total stations, GNSS receivers, and all the geotechnical stuff that's, that's on a site. That will sit on a, on, a, on a server, we would call that. Generally a laptop on site, something like that. If you've got multiple sites around the country or around the world, it'll be feeding into a desktop, a T4D desktop, um, generally at your company headquarters or something like that, and that will be the hub, basically, that collects data from all the different monitoring sites that you might have um, around the country. And then the T4D web, the web module, reads that desktop. So what people want to see, basically, right from the project administrator to um, all the different people who, who have a hand in this project. They want to see a nice, simple, straightforward uh, interface, the web interface, whereby they can hop on to any of these um, projects, um, whatever they're involved with, uh, and that's, that's the web module itself. So this is it, and this is what it looks like. It's, you know, it's icon-driven, and it's, it's meant to be very, very straightforward and easy to use because we recognize that a lot of people will be using this not just the, the, the more technical people. So essentially, um, taking you through the software, whatever's going into the software, you can have a look at. So these, these are various sensors that are, that are feeding into this project, and we can click on those individually to, to have a look at the, the positions of them, the, um, the residuals, how much they're moving about, um, each, and, each and every one, and then we can, we can take them each one bring more in as, as, as they become available to us. We can have a look at the map, so actually where our monitoring projects are, and zoom in and, and have a look at where our individual sensors are and things like that. Um, custom view takes it one step further. We can add some imagery here, populate the imagery with our sensors, and those in, sensors are glowing a nice green at this point, but they will go amber or red depending on what trigger levels we've set inside the software to give us um, a head start basically in, in this view. Uh, if you've got 500 prisms in your monitoring scheme, then prism 312 and prism 397 don't really mean very much, but if you've got them on a screen like this and people can see very quickly and easily um, the, 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 say the prisms on, on the top of the building started to glow amber, and then red and the ones under them went amber, then we would know straight away where the issue is and what to act on. Uh, likewise, you know, we can bring in sort of SketchUp models again as, as imagery here um, and, and populate them um, in the same sort of way. And what, what we've done here is anchored in those positions of those particular sensors so that, that they will always show those um, those residuals and you can turn those off and on at, at your so design. Of course everything coming in we can chart out so uh, you know, from keeping it to a, you know, not too complex a, a chart we can we can make our own charts so we don't want all the sensors all available all in, in one go, we can, we can tailor them and uh, uh, make them a bit easier to use. Um, the calculation sensor in this sort of view um, allows us to basically compute any result that we want um, based upon the sensors that are going in. Um, we can further analyze and calculate trends and things like that. If things are drifting apart from each other, you know, we can we can calculate distances based upon um, various sensors and things like that. So there's, there's lots of different um, ways we can analyze the data going in. Logs, um, we can create logs if, if things are moving about. So if we go back to the last slide and we can see various spikes, um, you will actually see a log on with the left, just as things start to move about. Um, you know, you can, you can put in there and crane arrives on site or something like that and, and things will start bouncing about and, and you expect that. But 
you put a log in, and then you're not going to scare people when they have a look at the results. Alarms. Alarms are a lot more intelligent now. We can we can obviously alarm um, emails and things like that when when things are going wrong. But people actually want also to be alarmed when things come back online or when things are, are trending. So not just the first time that something steps out of tolerance, but perhaps the third time it steps out of tolerance, or if it continues to be out of tolerance, but the same way out of tolerance, not just bouncing about a little bit. So there's various various different alarms, alarms that can be set up by people. Webcams are very useful because a lot of um, people going onto this software might go to site very rarely, if at all. Um, so if they can sort of virtually arrive on site via a webcam and see what's going on, then they can have an appreciation for um, you know the results that, are, that they're seeing at that, at that moment. And then just a very touch on uh, the actual settings for the accounts. Everything from a project administrator for the, the actual manager or monitoring manager to just a very stripped down user version for perhaps a local resident who's allowed you to put a prism on his window or something like that. You know, what, whatever you want to set up in here, you can, you can associate the, the right uh, level of um, detail for that. Um, so just a, a quick touch on um, some real life projects really um, with, with um, Trimble systems in place. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. This is the floating bridge um, over Lake Washington in Seattle in America. And what the client was asking for here, they were very concerned about um, high wind speeds and this structure buffeting, a vertical movement basically. So there's a series of GNSS receivers um, along the structure as well as uh, weather stations um, so that they can have a look at the effects of the high wind and how much we're moving about vertically in, in this case. And the Zurich Central Station uh, in Switzerland, this is really a massive scheme. Uh, they were basically constructing a new station underneath the existing station. So there was a lot of, a lot of um, digging about underground, as you can imagine. There were new tunnels being formed. Um, as well as new track. So they needed to put into place a lot of um, monitoring for this one. So there was, in the end, I think 80 S8s on site. Uh, the client conducted a test of various sensors before. They called it a pre-selection benchmark test um, before deciding on the S8 um, and up to sort of 2,800 targets on here measuring sort of half a million data sets a day. So it's a really, a really massive scheme. Um, the S8 basically gave them the one millimeter accuracy that they needed. Um, you know, sort of 100 targets in, in 30 minutes they were they needed to achieve. Um, and you know that, that was that was good for them. And they also needed to achieve a, a 25 centimeter spacing for their prisms at 100 millimeters. And they needed to measure a target in six seconds. And so for, for all of those reasons, they, they went for the S8 in that, in that case. Um, and they also replied, um, they also needed to take reflectorless measurements when necessary as well. So the S8 also was, was useful in this case. Uh, so this is uh, Pudding Mill Lane in London. This is a project that's ongoing at the moment. Um, so Morgan Siddle are doing this as, as part of the Koshra project. Now, there's an automated track monitoring scheme already in place overhead of this bridge, but Crossrail wanted to, to take a closer look at this structure uh, from the underside. Now, they first considered um, putting in some prisms on the underside of the structure, but in the end went for a laser scanner because they thought, well, instead of just measuring a few bricks, which the prisms were installed on, we'll measure the whole structure and measure it many millions of points rather than just a few. So what they did is we we arrived on site and um, put in some control
control for the scanner to use. So tied into the prisms that are already part of the um, existing monitoring scheme on the periphery of the structure, and then installed some sphere targets for the, for the, for the scanner. Um, again, on the periphery of the structure and on the underside of the structure itself. And then from those targets, each day they do a scan, uh, which looks a little bit like this. Um, and this is based upon a master scan that they did um, before the work went ahead. And they bring that into a, a software called Trimble RealWorks to, to take out a, a twin surface comparison. And what, what they will see will really be nothing like this. This just shows you really a sort of a color plot of, of the differences really um, in level. They'll see something, hopefully anyway, a lot more boring, which is you know all really one color green and light blue, showing the sort of the finite, the millimeter sort of precision that they're getting. And it's a plus or minus two mil scan of this one, and that's that's more than adequate for what, what they're getting, and the repeatability they're getting in this case is, um, is very good. But that is because they always return the scanner to the same column every time, so the scanner always sees from the same line, line of sight, which is crucial in this case. Um, one other a GPS example here is the Palawara copper mine in South Africa. Now this is approximately 250 miles uh, northeast of Pretoria, and it's, it's almost 2,000 meters in diameter. So you can see this mine from space; it's that big. Now, as you can see, there's been an awful lot of movement um, in the past, and they're keen because of you know, various infrastructure around the the mine itself that this obviously does not happen again, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. So they sort of spotted the next the next sort of area of, of major concern and surrounded that area basically around the periphery with various GPS, uh, a couple of base stations, various rover stations um, to really give them an indication of what's going on there. Um, the last sort of global um, one to show you is the, the, the reconstruction basically of the World Trade Center. Um, there is a series now of um, SA monitoring for total stations uh, around the sort of the outer wall, if you like. And there's also a metro line that runs underneath the construction area. And it's crucial again for us to to, to set up instruments inside that tunnel, measuring prisms um, down the length of the tunnel, so you need a, a narrow field of viewing the instruments, which is very useful here, um, to make sure there's no, nothing going awry now. Okay, uh, the last one is the De Beer project in London, which was undertaken by Sir Robert McAlpine. Basically, it was a uh, demolition of um, two Kensington hotels. Um, and then the reconstruction of uh, a development afterwards, uh, retaining the, the very nice facades that are in place. Now, this project, um, in its infancy, they employed um, a subcontractor to do the to do the, the monitoring for them. Uh, the, the the results were coming through, perhaps just slightly slowly because of um, you know the way it was set up and that they wanted to manage the project in-house. So they approached us and we, we, we helped them in, in setting up their, their scheme basically. So it needed to be a very quick turnaround because construction was, was already underway. Um, but once, once installed, it didn't take long to prove itself. As piling was um, was going on, movement was picked up one Friday night. Um, by Saturday morning, temporary measures were already in place, and by Monday, the problem was permanently rectified. So it was it was proving itself to be a very quick scheme, and very results were readily available very, very quickly. As the project got extended, um, the instruments got higher and higher up into the build. These had to be powered by the sun because they were well away from any um, power source. Uh, and really the project was a great success. You know, it taught them that setting up their own system 
um, you know, was was the way to go really. And I think this project um, shows clearly that you know by taking a, a bit of a leap um, in, in undertaking the monitoring for themselves, um, you know, it gave them a, a quicker, more detailed response to their client. Um, and it also saved them a, a lot of money in the process because they didn't have to employ a subcontractor. And the, you know, the, the equipment that they purchased in this case um, has, has since been moved on to other automated monitoring schemes and also you know, taken down from this one and given to their surveyors for general survey um, or, or manual monitoring. So that's about it. Thank you very much. Um, just you know, a quick, a quick look at, at some of the, the monitoring uh, techniques and um, instrumentation that's being used, and um, some of the projects that we're using them on. So thank you for listening, and I'll I'll, I'll take some questions. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, please please do ask questions. Um, we've got a couple already, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, just use the, the question pane on the uh, right hand side of your screen. Okay, uh, first question we've got here is from Dominic. Uh, regarding the R10 at the beginning, do you have to pay for the X fill and can you correct for pole fill? Uh, okay, um, X fill is, is included with an R10. No, you don't, you don't have to pay for X fill. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's already included in the system. So, uh, no additional cost. Um, you can correct for pole tilt. This would be a manual correction at, um, at the moment inside the Trimble Business Centre software. Um, we should we should see an automation fairly shortly, I would imagine. But at this at this time, that would be a, a manual correction. Okay. I've uh, I've got a question here from Mark who asks, how do you bring in geotechnical sensors into the software? Uh, okay. So. Um, you can you can bring in a, a broad array basically of the geotechnical sensors. Um, they they get streamed into the software the same the same way as, as other um, instruments would do. Um, you may well need a data collector on site, but essentially all we would need would be some sort of digital readout, a CSV or an ASCII file, um, and we should be able to bring in most types of geotechnical sensors. You know there would be some. That wouldn't come in, but most types would. Okay, I've, uh, I've got another question from Mark, who asked, "How much does an SA cost?" Okay, um, well, there's obviously there's various options with S8, but an auto lock unit for monitoring the fine lock can be anything up to about fifteen thousand pounds. Okay. Does uh, Does anyone else have any more questions? If you just want to type the word yes, and we'll, we'll hang on for you to type your questions. Okay, I think that's um, all the questions we've got today. Um, if you'd like to get any more information, then you can contact us or uh, visit our website. You can also get up-to-date information on events and future webinars on our Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter pages. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for attending this morning and thanks to Chris for presenting. And we look forward to seeing you all again on future webinars. Thanks everyone. Thank you.